I kind of wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about this age, epigenetic age acceleration. I mean, we've been mm -hmm. sort of talking about how people age at different rates. I think you were a co-author on one of those, one of the studies like a few years back that um, was one of the big ones that came out where it was like people age at different rates and there was like 18 biomarkers that were looked mm -hmm. at and I think it was PNAS or something. A PNAS oh yeah, paper. the Belsky paper. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and it was like, look at people are aging at different rates and, and you can even look at their faces and it correlates with their yeah. you know, biological age more than their chronological age. And, yep. um, so, so to me, there, you know, clearly there's lifestyle factors, environmental factors that, are, that play a role in the way you age. Um, can you explain to people what epigenetic age acceleration is and what some of the most robust biological, environmental, perhaps social mm -hmm. causes of age, epigenetic age acceleration are? Yeah, so, so we usually use this term age acceleration to just mean kind of the discordance between your chronological age, so the age you know that you are, and your predicted age based on whether it's grim age or pheno age or any of these epigenetic clocks. Um, and that, again, is we think it's biologically meaningful. So someone who's predicted much older than they are chronologically are people who are higher risk for disease or mortality. Um, and so you know, the next question is why are some people predicted older and other people are predicted younger? Um, and a lot of people think, oh, it's just genetic. You know, I, you know, maybe my family is just high risk. But actually, it seems to have very little impact on your epigenetic age. So I think they estimate like 10, maybe at the uppermost 20% impact. Your genes have that kind of impact on your epigenetic aging rate. And actually, probably the majority of it is environment and lifestyle. Um, and when we look, again, these are not clinical trials. It's looking at epidemiological data, so just saying, in the population, the people who are predicted to be older versus people who are predicted to be younger, what are their characteristics? Um, we find things that are not surprising. So socioeconomic status is a big thing in terms of differences in epigenetic age, but also behaviors. So smoking really accelerates your epigenetic age. Uh, generally, exercise will tend to decrease epigenetic age. Eating, we think, probably plant-based diet is going to decrease epigenetic age. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the things don't drink heavily, get you know good quality sleep, minimize stress, all, all the things that everyone's mother and grandmother told them to do in life. How does, um, how does the male, being a male, mm -hmm. affect epigenetic age? Because males live on average, what, four years? Like their, their yeah. lifespan's like four or so years Shorter, shorter than females, right? Yep. Is that reflected in Yeah, it, it is reflected in epigenetic. So on average, not again, not across the board, but if you look at the distributions, females on average will have slower or lower epigenetic age than same age, okay. same chronological Similar age. Similar question. Um, females undergo menopause when, they're, yes. when they reach like 50s or something like that. Yep. Um, plus or minus, you know, I don't know how many years, but how does menopause affect epigenetic aging? Yeah, so this is actually a study I did while I was in c 4 lab. So we looked at women who undergone menopause and how long since they'd gone, undergone menopause. And it seems to be that menopause is actually an epigenetic aging accelerated event. So before menopause, women are doing pretty well. And then when they go through menopause, it seems to accelerate their epigenetic age. And we didn't have the kind of data you would want where we'd have the same women pre and post, but um, we can even look at surgical menopause, and that seems to also show this kind of accelerated epigenetic aging kind of manifestation. It's interesting, and um, sort of on the flip side of that would be, like like you mentioned, like is the epigenetic, are the epigenetic aging clocks biomarking something, like mm -hmm. the, something else that's causing aging? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a study that you were a co-author on I, this, I was kind of, as I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, well, in my mind, I was like, well, what, how could you, like, cause something, like, that would be massive damage mm -hmm. uh, to accelerate aging? And so I, I Googled uh, chemo th cancer chemotherapy epigenetic clock, and, like, your paper you were a co-author came up on. And I was like, oh, this is in Morgan's on it. Okay. <laughs> so I was reading the paper, and these patients that had head and neck cancer, mm -hmm. and they were getting treated for it, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, 
they were um, they were treated, you know, which causes massive damage, inflammation. Mm -hmm. These patients, um, their epigenetic age was measured before the treatment, after the treatment, and then six months later and a year later. And it was so interesting to me because they had aged, like their epigenetic age had accelerated by 4.9 years right after the treatment. Mm -hmm. But then six months later, and a year later, like their epigenetic age had like normalized back to baseline. Mm -hmm. And um, a sub-analysis then showed actually not only did the epigenetic age acceleration of almost five years correlate with inflammatory biomarkers, mm -hmm. but people that were, that had extremely high bio, inflammatory biomarkers one year later did still experience mm -hmm. the um, age acceleration. So um, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on what that means. Like, does mm -hmm. that to me, I mean, to me, I look at that and I go, wow, inflammation is causing epigenetic age, age acceleration. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah. you see this like graph, right? I mean, yep. so. Yeah, I think definitely when we measure aging in blood, we have to think, you know, what is, you know, probably driving these, these signals that we see. And I, I would guess that epigenetic age acceleration in blood is mostly reflective of inflammation. Unless, again, you're developing a clock that's specifically tuned to some other thing. Although inflammation seems so, you know, vast and systemic, it, it affects so many different things. Um, but I don't think everything that epigenetic clocks are capturing is inflammation. Because again, uh, when you look at immortalized cells, it's not because they're becoming more inflammatory every time you're passaging them, per se. But definitely, I think epigenetic aging measured in blood is very much tied to inflammation, which again is probably why it's highly predictive of a number of diseases, which we know inflammation can be a major driver of. Is that where um, the extrinsic and intrinsic aging clock, or I don't, I don't know exactly, yeah. like one of them considers the external factors in blood and one doesn't or something? Does, infl yeah. does inflammation calculate it in that or not really? Is it sort of... Yeah, so these are two of the first generation clocks. So I think, you know, Steve kind of called them intrinsic, extrinsic aging. Um, I think he called the original Horvath pan tissue clock was the intrinsic aging. It wasn't... Um, that tuned to differences in kind of cell turnover or inflammation. Um, whereas uh, clock he, that was developed by um, Hannum et al., he kind of added these different kind of cell composition measures that it, it actually ended up picking up inflammation a little bit better. Um, but this was before these second generation clocks came into being. And then I think once they came into being, we, they're probably picking up inflammation a lot more um, than even the first generation clocks. And, and again, we can make these kind of systems clocks, and one of our systems is inflammation, and it is, we can show that it's highly, it's highly predictive of outcomes. It's definitely capturing things related to inflammation. Preliminarily, I can say we have data um, from individuals with COVID, and we can look at the inflammation measure, and we find that people with severe symptoms have much more accelerated inflammation epigenetic clock than people with basically asymptomatic or mild symptoms. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see um, when those symptoms resolve and how long it takes for a person mm -hmm. to like go back to more of their baseline yep. if ever, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but, but so that, that's, that's definitely, are you guys going to continue looking at that or? Yeah. I mean, we don't have the ability to track the same people over time, but I think this mm -hmm. is an important thing. And I think this is important when people start to look at applications of the clocks for intervention testing, because you can do an intervention that's going to change kind of your blood cell composition, and it, it might be reflective of inflammation, but you know, it could be this acute event, right? And whether that really means you change your aging, I think is still needs to be kind of... right. Considered. Yeah, and that was the big, I think that was the big eye opener for me when I read this mm -hmm. study. I don't know a couple of days ago, and it wasn't a new study, but um, yeah, you know, it was like, oh, well, this changed really dramatically, but then it wasn't like a permanent thing. I yeah, mean, it was it went back, and so yeah, it's 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 almost like you're saying with interventions, it's like, well, I mean, make sure you didn't get sick or like you know, yeah, you weren't exactly. sick like too early before you know measuring, and and we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, a little bit later, but I kind of, to get sort of just back into the cause and effect of aging and, and if the epigenetic clock changes are really causal, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. you're obviously trying to figure that out.
But even like even if it was let's say downstream of something, if it was biomarking mm -hmm. aging, what like the epigenetic changes that are happening with aging? You kind of mentioned this early early in the podcast about how um, you know they're they're clustering in, in gene regu re regulatory regions, and so mm -hmm. they're changing the way genes are turned on or turned off. Like, is there like a feed forward loop in aging where it's like okay now these epigenetic changes are turning off genes that we want on to repair damage and they're turning mm -hmm. on genes that are cellular senescence or you know yeah. so it's like accelerating this like feed forward loop Is yeah that yeah i mean it's definitely possible i think it's yeah it's really hard to figure out causality here right like and it could be that you know I mean, my my perspective is not there's a cause of aging, right? And the, you know, there it's this thing, and once you fix that, everything else will go away. I mean, so many things go wrong, and your system can change. It can diverge in some. Going back to kind of Mike Snyder saying, even if you bring that down to the molecular level, there's so many different ways that someone's system can kind of change over time. And I don't think it's like you just need to. It's just this one thing that's going to then drive all of aging. Um, and yeah, it, it this you know our systems are responsive, right? So one thing changes, something else is going to respond, and that can be maladaptive, which would you know snowball things. So yeah, I think it's going to be hard to figure out like what's causal, what's correlative. But I would say even if it's not the what some people might consider the central driver, as long as it's picking up things that are critical to aging, and you can use that to track aging or understand it a little bit better, I think it still has utility. I don't know if it needs to be kind of the central cause of aging for it to be useful. 